Hi, this is Ushio, and welcome back to Echo. We are getting into Jenna's route, but the problem is, Carl is missing. Leo has turned into a, a massive, unpleasant person, so he's kind of gone off on his own, and everybody has split up. Jenna's going to stay at Carl's house, hopefully he comes back, and everybody else has gone their separate ways. Flynn's going to check somewhere, TJ's going to check somewhere else, and we're going to go to Mary Drive. So here we go. I take the bend out of Mary Drive, trying to squint through dust kicked up by my vehicle, past the sagebrush ahead. Carl isn't exactly small or stealthy, so if he's around here, I should be able to see him. The more I drive, the more I start to notice how little maintenance the dirt roads receive out here. My tyres kick up topsod and gravel, and divots mar the surface and jolt me in my seat. Unlike Flynn's truck or Leo's van, my little clunker isn't meant for these sorts of roads. I can practically feel my maintenance bill growing. As I approach the turn off of Jasmine Street, I pull over onto the side of the road. I reach back into my shorts and take my wallet, placing it in the glove box and locking it, just in case. Wow, it's a rough kind of area he thinks he's going to get mugged. Stepping out of the vehicle, a cool sweat begins to form along my neck, and I have to remind myself that I'm 21. We're all adults, I can drink, I have a car, I live by myself, and Cole is in trouble. As I walk through the clearing of dry bush, I'm reminded of the last time that I was here. I had a fight with my parents. I think it was over my grades or Leo or something. Eventually, I'd had enough of being yelled at and took off for a generic teenage angst walk. My MP3 player was with me all the time, so I'd put my earbuds in and had the emo core cranked up. Hours passed, and it was like I wasn't even awake, just meandering through the desert, bleary-eyed and directionless. I must have ended up on Jasmine, because the abandoned school was nearby. I remember stopping to kick a rubber tyre or something, and before I could, an arm appeared. It was furless, a sort of pinkish, and incredibly long. It just sort of showed up in the corner of my vision, stretching out in front of me, like someone was trying to hug me from behind. The music on my MP3 player had stopped, and there was a complete absence of sound besides the ringing in my ears. For some reason I still don't understand, I didn't move, and maybe I was too scared. I did speak, but all I could say was, hey, and then someone hit me over the back of the head and called me a cocksucker. They tried to take my mp3 player too, but I was clutching it so tightly at that point they couldn't get me to release it, no matter how many times they hit me in the head. I ended up telling Leo about it later, and he basically forbade me from ever going near Jasmine Street again. He kept asking who did it, and I'd tell him that I didn't know, but Leo thought I was just trying to keep him from harm. He went on a big speech about where he comes from, if somebody did this shit to a man's significant other they'd be fucking dead. I was tired and my head hurt, so I asked him how well that philosophy was working out for everybody else in his own country. That just made him even angrier, and he kept going on about how he's supposed to be the protector of us all. Hell, even name dropped Sydney to help prove his point, someone he almost never brings up because it kills the good mood. I come to the stop at the edge of the clearing. Wait, go back, what was the thing about the arm? Okay, never mind, carry on. The street sign on the corner, at the base of the hill, confirms my location. Jasmine Street. Also known as Tetanus Alley, if you ask Flynn. No wonder Jenna changed her name. I make a point of keeping my tail from touching the ground, occasionally checking the path ahead for shattered glass. I look through the shattered windows of abandoned manufactured homes and littered hilltops. I can't imagine Cole being in a place like this. Approaching Jenna's old house, I take stock of how it's aged. Poorly. It's stucco, unlike most of the other trailers about, but it hasn't seen a good coat of paint in at least a decade. The lawn is overgrown with weeds, and old convenience store wrappers lay entangled within the grass. Even as little kids we never played here, Jenna would always insist we go to Leo's or my house. Listening in and peering through the torn screen windows, I can see that no one's home. Moving on around the back, I hear some chatter behind the half-demolished home next door. Some familiar voices stand out instantly. I keep out of sight behind the debris. No, it wasn't like that. Heather says this with a babyish whine, practically a coo. There's a rasp to her speaking voice that I don't remember her having. You lit him up all day into that shed, and you're saying that you didn't do that? No. He was really, really sweet. I mean, he had an accent and everything. What kind of accent? That voice I don't recognise. It's sort of gravelly, but artificial, like someone trying to make their voice sound deeper than it is. You know, the Hispanic ones. Is that still, you know, PC to say, because my cousin was telling me off fierce-like for using that other word? 
You called Josh a wow. Okay, but I meant it in a good way, you know, like when I call you my night rat. You can call me whatever the fuck you want, Heather. Just don't be throwing that shit around when Jer's trying to sell. Chill, dude. He still bought it from me. How much? It's in the book. He might not next time. Dude. Ever since you, you got back, you're so much more assertive. The unknown voice doesn't respond. Jeremy speaks up again. So, what happened with Juan? We just talked, you know. He wants to be a baker. He said next time we'll meet, he'll bring me some guava cappuccinos. Those are those apple turnover looking things, right? God, I'm hungry. Oh, sounds good. Why'd you have to bring up apple turnovers? Well, that's sort of what cappuccinos are. You brought them up. Jeremy laughs in his trademark bassy and abrupt titter. Are you going to give Juan your cherry pie next time you see him too? What? Oh. I don't know how to cook. I don't even have a stove. Fuck me. The voice groans. It's slang for vagina, you know, slice of cherry pie. I wouldn't put my junk into a vagina that looked like a slice of cherry pie. You're gross. What? He said it. You both are. Heather says this with a snooty flair, though it's subverted by her voice's more dopey childish undertone. I gotta get out of this town. You haven't been back in that long. Are you upset about the dreams again? Yeah, the dreams and shit are getting worse. But it's other stuff too, okay? You just need to relax, dude. Smoke some, you know? That's what works for me when I get them. I'm trying not to use up the stuff I'm trying to sell. I gotta save up, you know? Everyone around here seems to be losing their shit, more so than usual. Plus that fucking bear leering around here all the time. Brian keeps pushing me to sell this cut injectable stuff, won't tell me what it is. Wow, really? There's a pause in the conversation. Keith wants to say hi to his mum before work. What? Keith wants to say hi to his mum before work. Heather? Keith wants to say hi to his mum before work. What's wrong with her? Why are you saying that, Heather? An increasing sense of urgency takes hold in Jeremy's usually calm, lackadaisy tone. Keith? You mean Keith from... Heather begins to sob. Her crying is sputtering and wet. I can hear it from here. Oh god. Heather, dude, what's wrong? She continues bawling, her whining cry increasingly shrill and choked. Oh my god. Heather... I can't deal with this right now. Micah, give her a joint. Micah? What? What? I'm not giving her any more of mine. She's probably putting this shit just to get more. Dude, now. I got some of mine in the mini storage out back. Just hurry, okay? Fuck. Okay, okay. Hearing footsteps, my heart lurches. I move back around to the other side of the structure, praying that my clumsy otter self is actually stealthy for once in my life. However, it isn't long before I see him round the same corner I just did. What in the goddamn shit? Micah's big eyes widen in alarm, the words catching his throat, higher pitched than the others. There's a pause, and having been caught, I haven't got a clue what to say. Well, shit, really is you. He mutters, his face taking a more stern expression. Uh, what? What the fuck are you doing here, schizo? I'm jolted for a moment, that being something I haven't been called in years. I swallow, crossing my arms and trying to look nonchalant. I'm looking for Jeremy. Thought you fucked off to college like the rest. I thought you disappeared back in 08. A quiet huff escapes the small bat. Well, I'm here now. Heather's crying can still be heard in the background, her banshee-like wails providing an odd ambience to this reunion. Why do you need to see Jeremy? Looking for Cole. An indiscernible expression takes hold upon Micah's face, intense with his gaze flicking to his surroundings. Rich goat ain't here. Why, Leo with you? No. Suddenly, Jeremy approaches from around the corner. Dude, what's taking- what the hell? The stout Fenix turquoise eyes bulge. He's much more round than I remember him, looking like a mix of Jenna with Carl's body. Schizo's here, oh Jesus, where's the wolf? Says he's not here. Guys, um, I'm looking for Cole. Even the police are searching for him now. Micah tenses the hell up at that information, his standoffish demeanour completely gone. One of the few people he talked to before he went missing it was around midnight with you, Jeremy. Have any idea where he could have gone? Jeremy stares ahead of me blankly. There's a certain warmth that Jenna possesses to her gaze that her brother completely lacks in. I look at Jeremy now, and all I can see are all the times he's threatened me over stuff I didn't do, called me stuff, and hit me. Yet yeah, there's definitely something different in his demeanour than I remember. He's less intense. Schizo, I'll tell you if I knew. I just hooked him up yesterday, like a quarter mile from his house. 
Ever since he crashed his ride, he makes me come out there to him when he wants to buy her. So he didn't mention anything about running off. Ah, oh, I can't see Carl running. Why the hell would he want to, when he's got everything he'd ever want in the castle? The castle? Which is why it's worrying that he's not there. Did it look like someone broke in? No. Oh. You didn't give in anything laced, did you? I don't really know how all that works. No, it's the same stuff I smoke. That's not that reassuring, but I nod regardless. Well, uh, thanks. We're staying at Cole's if you hear anything, or see him around somewhere. Jeremy frowns, counting his head to the side. We? Is Jenna with you? Yeah. Jeremy's frown deepens, but he doesn't look exactly angry or anything. Oh. There's a pause of silence, punctuated by a choked sob from Heather behind the house. How's she doing? The usual? Better than everybody else. Jeremy's frown shifts to a lopsided smile, the fox even grinning for a second. One of his front teeth is chipped in half. That sounds about right. Michael looks over his shoulder. Gonna get that joint now? Alright, he sidesteps, grunting as he passes. Nice soul patch. Wow. Snap back, say nothing. Whatever. Say nothing. Michael moves on toward the mini storage without incident, though I feel a boiling in my cheeks. My fists begin to clench. We're adults. Why the hell do they still treat me like this? This must be how TJ feels. Jeremy watches Micah for a moment before scratching his gut. His eyes are upon me now. Yeah, you should go now. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll let Jenna know that everything's, um, all good here. Jeremy just stares at me and then walks back to Heather. She's still crying. Weird as hell. But we've made it to Thursday. That's the first time we've met those guys, so that's, that's Jenna's crew. A very rough lot. What is going on here? Chains dragging him down? Hey! Who the fuck's this? So you're leaving? Running off to fuck some other wolf? It's a joke. Calm down. We were just trying to have some fun. I was starting to realise that this probably wasn't the best time, but... So you're playing this stupid game of keeping me guessing whether or not you're going to ditch me by next year? And then you pull this shit outside. The hell is wrong with you? Me? You know, I told her that there was no way in hell you'd fall for this since you already knew how I felt about you. I'm the one that should be fucking offended that you think that. That's not fair. You wanted a reaction from me and you got one. Happy? What's wrong? This is your idea. The phone clutched in the hand disappears. It's a prank. Making me think I just lost my Otto is a prank. If this is a fucking joke, then you need to learn how to make one first. Why don't you learn how to take one? How's I supposed to take that? Just laugh and shrug and say, well, fuck, so much for that. Is that what you expected? Actually, we just thought you wouldn't fall for it. At least not this hard. I mean, come on. I cropped that from the cover of some teen magazine. It was my number two, if you didn't notice. It, it just wasn't a good time, alright? No. Hmm. No. What the hell are you doing here, anyway? Semester ended last week. So you're staying at home for the summer? Of course not. I'm staying with Emily. You need to calm down, Leo. How can we ever have fun if you're exploding all the time? Telling me to calm down is the worst thing that you can do right now. I'm tired and hot, and I just wanted to have lunch with him. You're overreacting. I'm going to Pueblo, Leo. I stare through the grainy darkness. The motel room air is dry and stuffy. The air conditioner must be off. I look over. TJ's next to me in bed. He's curled up in a fetal-like position, his knees raised and his tail between his legs. TJ doesn't usually sleep like that. Leo lays in the bed across from us. He's laying on his back, his form perfectly still. There are no covers on him, and he's still in his jeans from yesterday. Neither of them are snoring, or even audibly breathing for that matter. It takes me a moment, but I can't actually tell if Leo's eyes are closed or not. I picture it in my mind, him slowly turning his head, looking right at me with no expression. He has no eyes, they're just shadows. I blink trying to shift my legs beneath the sheets. Unfortunately, I can. I'm not dreaming anymore. 
Leo isn't actually looking at me. Why did I even think that? And why does it make me so unnerved? And that dream? Jesus. I slide my feet out from under the covers and sit upright on the edge of the bed. Maybe a splash of water will make me feel better, though I could really use a dip in an actual pool. At Pueblo, there's so many of them around, I take it all for granted. The realisation dawns on me that once I graduate, the chances of me being able to afford a place with one nearby are almost none. I wring my towel, some in my paws. My fur is oily and damp. I'll definitely need to take a shower in the morning. Hell, if the motel tub didn't look like it had seen 20 years worth of dirty feet pissed and cum, I'd probably take a bath. But first, I've got to get that AC going. I walk over to the wall-mounted AC by the window. I'm surprised this place doesn't use swamp coolers like every other home in Echo. It takes a second for my eyes to adjust to the darkness, but I manage to find and turn the control knobs. Despite cranking the theme to the max setting, only a petty steam of air is exuded from the front vents. It is cold though, so there is that. I stick my face up to it, the blowing air on my whiskers making my jowls raise instinctively. It's refreshing, and the world seems a little less hazy. Still, I feel gross, more so than usual. I remember on Saturday morning, I woke up super early to clean myself, trim my facial scruff and head fur, and just look as presentable as possible. I don't really know who I was trying to impress, maybe show everyone that I was all well adjusted and normal now. All the grooming work I performed didn't last four hours in the hot car ride up to Echo though, especially when the AC went out all the way from Gulch City to Route 93. I was nervous to see everyone again really. Rose tinted glasses and all that sort of thing will only last so long. I mean it's been three years and I haven't really made anything of myself other than becoming another college debtor in an oversaturated major. I'm not like General or TJ who are absolutely going places. Hell, from what I heard, even Flint became the city clerk. I guess I could relate more to Cole more than I originally thought. As much as I hate Echo, the moments of hanging with the group growing up are still some of the best I've ever had, even counting recent college happenings. We were all friends, but that friendship came with a lot of serious weight to it, baggage that was never unpacked, I guess. I didn't honestly expect us to even try to. Flynn had other plans, and who could blame him? After that, Leo's freak out and Cole going missing, any sort of semblance of a fun idle spring break is gone. It's like there's this buzzing tension in the air, methane filling up a room and just waiting for the lighting of a match. God, and here I am, whinging about how the mood is ruined when my old best friend is just fucking gone. What the hell was I honestly expecting? Us to all just hang up a bunch of Christmas lights in Leo's backyard, grill up some carne asada, get drunk, and dance to a bunch of indie playlists. And of course I'd fantasised about some sort of brief reunion with Leo. I mean, it's natural, right? What I didn't expect was this whole thing with Jenna. I'm still sorting out how I feel about it all. I glance briefly to my camera bags at the end of my bed. I have a feeling I'm not going to get much done for my project. With some reluctance, I pull my face back from the cooling vents and head to the bathroom. I try to shut the door behind me quietly, but it's still pretty loud. I look at the sink and realise that it isn't going to cut it. I tuck off my shirt and underwear and then place them on the edge of the counter. At home, I just throw them onto the floor, but I don't really trust how clean the lino is here. I step into the shower. It gets hot quick, so I fiddle with the handle some. There's some red fur tucked in the corner, so I'm guessing Leo took one earlier as well. He was worried the police would come by to his place, so he insisted on staying here while we searched for coal. I remember him and I used to take hour-long showers together back when my family was out of town. My parents had one of those walk-in Roman-style showers with marble tile. He thought it was the coolest thing. I bend down and pick up the tiny complimentary shampoo bottle from the rack and begin to lather the contents into my fur. It's not exactly the best for specifically my type of fur, but it will work for now. I bet Jenna would have loved that shower. She had to use an outdoor one for most of her life, as I recall. I think she lives off campus now in a studio apartment she picked out. I've never actually seen it. She's probably splurged with her full ride money and got something really nice. Bet it beats the head out of communal dorm showers, which are not as sexy as porn makes you believe. I begin lathering further down and the mental image of Jenna's golden form stick with water sticks in my head. I cut myself and squeeze a bit and I'm starting to- Okay, here we go. Why though? My heart thuds a little harder in my chest. Okay, I think by this point you can kind of imagine what Chase is doing in the shower while he's thinking about Jenna, so we're probably going to skip this. 
All right, so Chase did the thing that we thought that he was doing and fade to black and we move on. I step out of the bathroom in my towel. I wasn't expecting to take a shower when I first went to the bathroom, so I didn't bring a change of clothes with me. Creeping over on the pads of my feet, I disrobe and quickly begin to put on a fresh t-shirt and shorts from my bag. Uh oh. Chase. TJ and Leo are no longer in bed. The Lynx is over by the light switch, squinting blearily at me. Well, Leo blinks at me. Buenos dias. I quickly try to scamper on the rest of my shorts for going underwear for the time being. Oh, oh geez, uh, sorry Chase. TJ turns, quickly averting his gaze. Leo just sighs some, rubbing his eyes. Thanks for the show. Your phone was going off while you were in the shower. My cheeks feel a bit warm as I managed to finally get my shorts up to my waistline. Oh, uh, who called? Leo stares blankly at me, looking more tired than any of us. I wasn't going to check. An uneasy look punctuates that comment, and it catches me a little off guard. C can I turn around now? Oh yeah, TJ. Thanks. The Lynx uncovers his eyes and moves to the bed, sitting back down. He still looks like he hasn't fully woken up yet. Sorry for waking you guys. I was really needing a shower. Lots of stuff, you know. It's okay, Chase. You kind of woke me up from some pretty weird dreams. So thanks. He manages a smile, still trying to blink the blurriness out of his eyes by the looks of it. His irises begin to narrow back to a more slitted state. No problem, TJ. I actually should be getting back out there. It's 3.30 in the morning, though, are you sure? I finish putting on my shirt and move to check my phone. Yeah, I'm sure. Man, when I find that goat, I swear to God. He stretches some before stifling a yawn. I'm not gonna let him out of my sight for a month. It's a text from Jenna. Oh, hello? Hey Chase, I can't sleep, so I'm heading back to the motel. If you're up, do you want to go out looking with me? I'm feeling a little better after my shower, so I send Jenna a quick text, agreeing to help with the search. What does it say? TJ cants his head, peering at me with sort of a dazed, curious look. Jenna was having trouble sleeping, so she wants to go out searching. Leo looks up at me, his expression indiscernible. Isn't it kind of dark to try and look for him? I mean, not that I'm trying to dissuade you all, just kind of seems harder. It's that whole 48 hours thing. The harder we look now, the better. Sitting back and praying everything will work out won't do any good. TJ's eyes widen some, looking a bit taken aback. His jowls twitch some, the feline looking down at the sheets between his legs. I, uh... There's a knock at the door. The sound of jingling keys can be heard coming from the other side. There's a scratching noise of metal on metal, the door being unlocked, and after a moment it opens. Jenna steps out from the darkness, rubbing her arms some and making a beeline for her bag. Oh, excuse me. Hey, TJ, Chase, Leo. She nods to each of us in turn before beginning to rifle through her belongings. Aren't you supposed to be keeping watch at the house? Aren't you supposed to be in jail? TJ makes a noise that sounds like he just choked on his own spit. I try to avoid looking directly at Leo. He doesn't say anything, though I hear the bed he's sitting on creak audibly. She takes out two water bottles, tossing one to me. I only barely catch it, mainly because it's stopped by my nose first. Ow. My snout tingles with the aftershock. My nose feels kind of wet for some reason, though when I reach up, there isn't any blood. Must be the burst of blood vessels. Oh, from before. Ah, she stifles a brief, amused huff, looking apologetic. You're still trying to wake up, I see. You think that's funny? Just walking in and hitting him with that? Leo's crackling baritone comes out a few decibels too loud, his tone stern, like a scolding parent. It has a way of catching everybody's attention. That wasn't the intent. There's a pause, Leo about to speak again, but Jenna managed to cut him off before he can. Speaking of, we're going to go check in with Duke and see if he knows anything. Leo's jaw shifts, as if trying to speak, but the words don't come out. He leans back and forward again. Have fun. Chase, you're all set. She looks at me expectant. I guess she's ready to go. Oh, yeah, sure. I force a smile, trying to downplay the cavalcade of tension this room has become. Uh, bye guys, I'll see you later. TJ seems to be doing the same. Leo just stares. We'll text with us some updates in a bit. Jenna pats my shoulder once before heading out. And I follow suit. Wow, okay. The air is surprisingly fresh outside, even a bit damp. It's as if the motel room itself had its own oppressive atmosphere that has permeated my sinuses, and now I'm finally free. 
Near the horizon, thick grey clouds from loom overhead. The reservation must be getting some rain. Jenna seems to notice as well, taking a few steps forward into the mostly empty parking lot before speaking up. Kinda nice out, isn't it? Yeah. She opens her mouth to speak, but pauses some as she looks over her shoulder, a light frown crossing her blonde features. Come on, let's go. She starts moving again, heading toward the street. Duke's house, right? And we're walking? Yeah, is that a problem? She glances back. I reach down, feeling the tender, hardening muscles around my thighs and knees. I'm just still a bit sore from the hikes all. Oh, you're a tough guy, Chase. I'm sure you'll manage. A tough guy? I hustle some to catch up, the fennec already on the road. She smiles some as I catch up alongside her. Your phone has a flashlight, right? Yeah, oh, oh, give me a sec. I reach into my pocket and flick on my phone. Takes a second, but I find the right button. The cracked pavement in front of us quickly illuminated. Just in case we come across any snakes or spiders. Or overweight rams. Those two. I shine my phone toward the sagebrush that winds along the narrow wash that passes by the motel. It's like I'm half expecting to see Cole's goofy grinning muzzle peeking out through the brambles. I'm sorry if I woke you. It's fine, I was in the shower. You woke everybody else though. Hmm. Jenna straightens her tank top, peering through the cracked glass windows of the old ice cream shop. Even the folly sole on the awning is mostly faded away. It's still got that old Victorian style architecture that you see in a lot of the buildings built originally by the wealthiest settlers at the turn of the century. Faded green and pale blue paint still clings to parts of the main facade, with the copper metal roof a mix of dark amber and turquoise. In its heyday, it probably stood out something fierce, a colourful contrast to the harsh beiges of the desert, and ultimately an opulent reminder of the old world amidst the new. I wasn't expecting Leo to be there, honestly. He giving you any more trouble? I watched the pavement turn to pack dirt beneath my feet as we ran the corner onto Gretchen Road. It's the desolate stretch of road, only striking feature being a concrete mixing business that closed its doors back in the 90s. You can still see the big bounds of greyish dirt past the slatted chain link. Ultimately, it takes me a moment to respond to Jenna's question. No, he's, uh, he's just upset. I can practically feel the fox's incredulous raised eyebrow, a trademark reaction if she ever had one. Actually, well, this is going to sound stupid. Playing Leo's behaviour off as him being just upset is stupid, but continue. A sigh. Sorry. Jenna frowns some and moves closer, nudging my arm with her shoulder. Hey, you haven't done anything wrong. I don't know about that. Oh. Again, that expectant look. Ugh, here we go. I'm kind of glad that you texted me. I didn't really want to go back to sleep. I guess I was having a nightmare. The same sort of reoccurring one that I've been having that's a little bit different each time. Each dream, I'm facing myself, but it's not me. Not like a mirror me, and things are different and messed up and blurred. Sometimes I, well, it speaks and it's all distorted, like an old AM radio station with bad signal. Jenna looks away for a moment and then back to me. And each time it gets a little bit clearer, and it might just be because it's fresh in my head right now, but I kind of remember what it was saying. I stop briefly, shining the flashlight on a tumbleweed rolling across the dirt road ahead. It briefly gets stuck on a mesquite tree, bouncing against the trunk and leaving a few twigs behind before rolling back along its course. Do you remember when I texted you that I got into Pueblo and you drove all the way back down here to celebrate? Yeah, I do. Well, we were going to surprise Leo, remember? I do. There's a delay in her words as she seems to already know exactly what incident I'm referring to. The prank. She lets out a long, drawn-out breath of air. We pretended you were cheating on him with those fake texts that I was sending you. He smashed your phone, and you told him that you were leaving Echo. Yeah, it wasn't the best of practical jokes to play on someone who was already fairly unstable. He wasn't... Chase, what does this have to do with your dream? She cuts me off, her tone more curious than stern. I know, it's just the whole thing was just playing back like some kind of record. Everything that happened. All the fake text messages you sent me as Jared, me leaving the phone on the table, Leo confronting me, and then you showing up and telling him it's a joke, and that he's overreacting, and smash. I make a motion, like I'm going to toss my phone down. Jenna flinches, instinctively grabbing for it, before slowly furrowing her thin brows at me. Has Leo been guilting you about that? No, not really. 
So, you've been feeling guilty then. I mean, I guess. Why else would this be, you know, manifesting in my subconscious and all that? Well, I'd usually recommend expressing this to Leo. If I didn't think that your attempts at reconciliation would be perceived by him as you trying to get back together. She rubs the bridge of her short nose before crossing her arms over her chest. We did already apologise for this years ago, but if you absolutely must, maybe wait until we're back at Pueblo. He's clearly got some issues to sort out right now, and you're under absolutely no obligation to try and solve them. Especially considering his recent behaviour. It's incredibly difficult to help people that don't want to be helped. Agree or disagree? Hmm. I mean... Yeah, she's probably right, and Leo's sort of started to distance himself from Chase as well. So yeah, you're, you're probably right. She gives me a sidelong look. I mean, you, you are right. I rub my paws across my face, smushing my own facial features into my paw pads. It's just shitty, I guess. You know someone for 15 years of your life and grow up with them? There's like, I don't know, vested interest. I was there for every big mistake, triumph, you name it. I'm not sure what exactly further support I can even offer at this point. It's just been too long. Plus, I'm gone again as soon as the weekend's up, so what's the point when I'm probably just gonna fuck things up even worse? Chase. Jedda's tone is curt, and I look over to see her face very much matches her tone. Leo is dry humping you at the kiddie arcade. You do not need to feel this conflicted about being upset about that. Look, there's a moment of hesitation, like she knows the right words to say, but needs time to phrase them more delicately. I understand that men have a different hormonal attraction to each other than generally what I feel, as a woman, when I'm attracted to someone. For men, that feeling of attraction, and I'm paraphrasing something you probably already understand, on at least an intuitive level, is broadly more physical and sudden. There's an emphasis on aesthetics, and well, the mechanics of what's happening. I blink, getting the gist of what she's saying, but not exactly sure where she's going with this. As stereotypical as it is, most women feel attraction as sort of a slow burn. Where passion is derived from intimacy, meaning contrast, forbidden love, etc. She gesticulates in a swelling motion. That's not to say abrupt sparks of fancy don't form for women too, urges being what they are. So I may not be adequately equipped to fully grasp the true nature of your guy's relationship, but... What Leo did at Family Plex is just beyond dumb latent horniness. It's complete detachment from reality of you two's respective situations. Jenna's voice raises some, louder than her usual controlled level, and probably inappropriate for this time of night. It's upsetting, especially so with all that's going on. I continue to walk slightly ahead of Jenna, unsure of what to say, and feeling like if I met her gaze right now, I'd regret it. I shine my light on the lone desert willow that sits on the bank of a nearby wash. In the branches, flickers of reflected light shine back. Eyes. They're small, and sitting squarely in a nest made from bramble, like that of the tumbleweed from earlier. Bird. I announce, monotoned. Jenna steps up beside me, hands on her hips, as she looks where I'm now pointing. She exhales with some exasperation before responding. Yeah. Looks like a wren. How can you tell? As far as I know, Jenna was never much into nature or animals. Wrens are the really fat ones, you know, rotund. She pushes her small hands together, making a circle to emphasise the roundness. Her eyes must be better than mine, because I can only just barely make out a beak. I look back at Jenna, and she's still staring up at the tree. Something about the whole scene of it gives me this strange twinge of nostalgia. Us wandering aimlessly about Echo, with nowhere to go, and nothing to do, and how we thought that feeling would last forever. Is it just me, or is this conversation kind of familiar? N not the bird, I mean. You and I walking around, talking about stupid things Leo's doing? Yeah, that's not too far out of the ordinary. She smiles some, and I can't help but smile back. Yeah, that and... God, do you remember showing me all those Yahweh comics you got from them all? Damn. Oh yeah, I hid them under a rock, like a half mile from my house. I had to fight a scorpion to get you the Koko Tanuki eye issues. Wow. Jedha lets out an amused noise, shaking her head. Well, my relationship with the rest of the group besides Leo had mainly stayed the same after they found out I like guys. Jenna and I actually grew more close after the fact. Despite not really being too into anime, talking to her about manga and the dumb romance stuff in them was always kind of fun. My hero, yeah? I sort of remember discussing the differences between Yaro and Barra. Wow. Okay, I'm not explaining these terms. I am aware and I do understand, but I'm not explaining them to you. 
You talking just now kind of reminded me of that. Saying those two words out loud feels weird. Boy's love and man's love, right. I do remember that, Chase. I'm a little surprised you do. She says this with a false teasing tone to her voice for some reason. I can't my head curiously toward her. Why wouldn't I? I really enjoyed all that, talking with you about it, I mean. Truly, I suppose I thought that I was only being humoured for my special interest topics that the rest of you were not remotely as interested in. It's a little creepy, now that I think about it in context. I wave dismissively. No, I mean, you weren't like a fan Yoshi or anything. Hell, you should have seen all that sort of yaoi junk Leo kept on his computer. He's talking about Fujoshi, by the way. Fujoshi, yes, and really? Sure, whatever, and yeah, he was pretty into more porny stuff. Jenna laughs some. Yeah, most yaoi is written by women who've never met a gay guy before, and is full of gender imprinted uke seimei tropes and dubious consent. Hey, sometimes that's hot. I'm surprised the words leave my mouth, and I immediately feel a burn around the edges of my ears. Jenna looks at me. I can't quite read her expression now in the darkness, though I'm not about to shine the flashlight on her. Yeah, that's part of why we read it. As long as it's understood as fantasy and not normalcy. Of course. I nod. But to take this back to reality for a second, no one should be forcing themselves on you like that, no matter what they've seen in the porn, or how long they've known you. Right, um, I appreciate the concern. I nod again at Jenna, who returns to scanning the nearby underbrush. However, I can't help but feel a little like I'm being treated like some kind of battered victim here. Maybe I'm just too numb these days to feel like I probably should. The road turns back into chipped asphalt as we get closer to the old rail yard. The tracks to which run directly behind Leo and Duke's backyards, not that they'd seen any use in decades. Most of the houses down the road are newer, and the county even installed a streetlight after an old badger lady got hit by a car five years ago. That being said, most of the residences stand vacant now, in various states of disrepair. As we round a bend, I spot Leo's house down the way. It's a little ranch-style house with a big backyard, right off a dirt road leading from the street. It used to be his family's home before they moved out. No cop cars parked out front or anything, not that I really expected there to be. Jenna slows for a moment, peering over her shoulder. Her senses are better than mine, so I lessen my pace as well, trying to listen carefully. It's dead silent beyond the usual desert ambience, the rustle of breeze-swept trees, chirping crickets, and tweets from local nightbirds. I turn back to look at her. What? She frowns to herself. Nothing. Wait, did you hear something? She shakes her head, rubbing her wrist as she refocuses her attention back on me. No, just some unexpected nostalgia. I smile some, glad I'm not the only one. Oh, what for? I can't exactly place it, it's kind of like a feeling. Almost sort of like what people call deja vu. Ah. I nod sagely, pretending to understand. She watches me for a moment, as if studying my features for something deeper. I watch her as well. The golden glow of the streetlight giving her fur a pale radiance, blurring her features into something warm and familiar. Her bushy tail sways, and I could see the light plumes of desert dust scatter away onto the asphalt beneath. They dissipate into the air like smoke from a cigarette. When we were younger, we had many nights like this, walking to and from Leo's place. Most of the time we'd be chatting about video games we'd been playing, or some manga that Jenna had gotten into. Looking back, I could tell that she savoured those times. The fleeting moments she had away from home, where she could express her passions without fear or judgement or ridicule. Well, occasionally there'd be ridicule. But of the good faith sort, I think. Whenever she criticised some dumb thing I said, or weird ass phase that I was going through, it never felt like she thought lesser of me. She suffered through my late 2000s frosted tip highlights scene phase after all. She was just trying to encourage me to be a better person. Those long walk and talks we always had were like, ways to gauge our own small town induced insanity. It was during those times I felt more secure in myself than I ever did elsewhere. But it's also when I, well, we understood we truly didn't really belong here. I can't help but wonder if that's what she's thinking of now. She smiles once and then picks up the pace again. I step up and match her speed. I hope Duke still works late shifts. I recall him being quite nocturnal when we were growing up. He works at the Blue Diamond Casino by the reservation, right? Yeah, as far as I can remember. I used to think that only native people could get jobs there. I know they tried to keep it that way, but many of the locals in the res lacked the skill sets and training for some of the jobs. Hence the outsourcing. 
I think Duke works, or at least worked, as a security technician. Oh, I guess I didn't know him that well. Me neither, but he was friends with my father. I could see Duke's house now, a large manufactured home that raised up like three feet off the ground. I think Flynn once told me they made him raise it up like that since it's set in the flood zone for the nearby wash. Said wash pretty much has never had any water in it, except for one particular monsoon season, where a flash flood sent white water currents down it. It all drains out into Lake Emma. It's difficult to see in the dark, but the house looks to be in a bit of a sorry state. The yard is overgrown with tall weeds, and there's a bunch of stripped bicycle parts and other electronic components strewn about. Jenna sees it too, and lets out an audible hum, as if acknowledging some confirmed suspicion. I'm about to ask her what's up, and that's when she speaks again. You know, my grandma never left the reservation, no matter how bad it got down there. I used to visit her a lot before she got sick. Oh? There's something about the tone in her voice that makes me think I should stop walking. I turn and focus on her. Hmm, I don't believe any of the other guys ever met her. She was probably the most down-to-earth member of my family. Despite generally believing in a lot of the old spiritual aspects of the Masata culture, like the rain dances, Jenna gives me a look that makes me immediately regret speaking, my tail curling instinctively. You're thinking of the Pascawa tribe. They're the ones that did the dancing around the bonfire bit that gets attributed to every native culture for some reason. Right, my bad. I give her a little thumbs up of understanding. I must look especially scorned, because Jenna begins to snicker a little. She reaches over, pushing my thumb down and squeezing my fist. Her grasp is incredibly soft, and I feel myself longing for it again as she lets go. Hey, you're a college-educated journalist now. You can't get away with cute ignorance anymore. I've got one more year left of that, actually. I say it with a faux defensive tone. I guess I should hold on to staying cute as long as I can. Oh, that's easy, Chase. All you have to do is lose the goatee. Oh, oh, come on. I reach up and grab the dyed piece of facial scruff, and the bubbling sense of self-consciousness burns at my cheeks. Jenna laughs some more. I'm just kidding. I know Leo isn't a fan of it, though. He told me as much. I let out a bit of a defeated noise. For some reason, it also kind of stings. Jenna waves dismissively, trying to get back to what she was saying. She seems serious about getting what she has to say off her chest. Anyway, Grandma had all this ham radio equipment in her house. She started collecting it after Grandpa died, which was long before I was born. She was really into technology and broadcasting, which admittedly was an oddball contrast from her more spiritual, tradition-based outlook on life. She crosses her arms, taking a glance inside an old parked pickup truck that's missing its place on the side of the road. I shine my phone's flashlight inside, but there's just a bunch of bags and what looks like farming stuff, mainly fertiliser. I remember thinking it was neat. She used to sit on her porch with her quilting gear and talk on the radio to passing truckers. Wow, really? I start to picture an old native woman who looks like Jenna, knitting needles in one paw and a radio mic in the other. Yeah, her radio had pretty good range. She did it for years, got kind of a reputation because of it. Sweetheart of Echo Valley, or something along those lines. Oh, nice. She was, like, flirting with them? Jenna smirks, lightly shrugging her shoulders. Well, I suppose there was probably some of that. I remember Adam mentioning that occasionally she would find flowers in her post box, sometimes even letters. Grandma was pretty shy, actually, and didn't like how she looked. When she was born, her ears and parts of her scalp were malformed. It was at some underfunded tribal clinic up north, so they weren't equipped to fix it, and didn't get the money for it later in life either. She brings her paws up to her own ears, running her fingers down them to the base of her head fur. She always wanted to wear these big sun hats, whether she went somewhere, like she didn't feel right being seen. But over the radio, she would mainly just talk to the truck drivers and ask them about their day, about things that made them happy. And I remember hearing about this one particular time, where she talked with the truck driver who had recently lost his wife in an accident. Naturally, he was really upset and was considering whether life was worth living anymore, so Grandma told him to pull over and come visit her. He was reluctant at first, but he did. Grandma got together all of the other old neighbour ladies and rolled out this big ancient grill from the 60s. They baked a bunch of fry bread and cooked up a ton of tacos. She even went out and personally got the ingredients to make some homemade cookies, since he mentioned he liked those over the radio. And when he got there, she taught him how to make all the food himself. She was worried that without a wife, he wouldn't know how to cook something decent on his own. She also went around and introduced him to everybody, treated him like a guest of honour. He was this little rat guy, 
really meek. At first he was worried he was being awkward and was out of place, but they talked for hours and hours, right into the night. His wife and him had been together for 18 years, and she was an art teacher at an elementary school in two canyons. So before he left, she and him made a sand painting. A sand painting? I'm reluctant to interrupt, but I've never heard of that before. It's a painting in the sand, usually done with pigments. What's interesting is, they're not really art objects. They're for helping people heal, to become better. Once painted, the person who needs the healing would sit in the centre of the painting. The energy and goodwill that was put into the painting was to help the person in need, healing spirits and that sort of thing. I know, nowadays you mainly see them framed up in roadside craft sales, but that's what they were originally for. So, uh... Jenna trails off, and I look away as she clears her throat. She takes a slow breath, and it takes her just a second to continue. My parents weren't there at Grandma's funeral. It was at some public meeting building out in Peyton for some reason. From my family, it was just Adam and I. Adam, really? Yeah, this was a long time ago, before we started changing. We were nearly a third of our way through the service when the right guy shows up, and I have to ask Adam who he is. The only people there up to that point were us foxes. After that, I started noticing more non-foxes coming in. Some were literally wearing their stereotypical trucker hats with the holy bits in the back, and of course, half the people there were really confused who these guys were, like maybe they were at the wrong funeral. They just sat in the back, and then Adam went up to speak. She folds her arms tighter across her chest, smiling to herself as the gaze flicks upward. Adam stuttered his way through his speech, but by the end of it, he started inviting up the new arrivals in the back. A lot of them were fairly gruff looking guys, you know? And one by one, they get up and started reading letters. She pauses again. Letters thanking her for being so kind, for giving them someone to talk to about their problems, or just being so witty and fun to speak to. The rad guy, god I wish I remembered his name, went up last, and his letter addressed grandma like she was still there with us. He talked about how he was doing, how tough things were after what happened. He mentioned his wife by name, and about how losing someone so good and special can make it feel like the world has become so much darker. But how it's always important to remember that there are still good people out there, even if they're just someone who can lend an ear for a while. And it felt like he was actually talking to us about Grandma. I thought about it a lot when, you know, Adam passed. About how maybe it wasn't just a chemical imbalance, and perhaps he just needed someone to talk to. She keeps her arms still tight over her torso, though it looks more now like her self-bracing measure. A far cry from her usual standoffish posturing. I also thought about how you're so goddamn alone out here. She gestures with both arms into her surroundings. I peer down at myself, and then back to Jenna. She lets out a little noise that sounds like a quick sigh before shaking her head. Not you specifically, but rather anyone stuck in this place. What is it with Echo, and taking away all that's good? She's looking at me now, but I might as well be a brick wall for how well equipped I am to answer that question. It feels almost rhetorical in nature, something with so many reasons that you could apply, that it becomes simply too much to try to put into words. I sheepishly hold up an arm. Would it be too patronising, too much of a stereotypical guy thing, to reach out to her now? It's a moment of vulnerability for someone who's cultivated a life's worth of being invulnerable. I suppose we've all got heavy shit under the surface, Jenna probably most of all. And while some of us sort of downplay it with jokes, self-depreciation, or lashing out at others, Jenna's always kept it under said surface. Seeing this all brought to light feels like something raw, uncomfortable, something understood to be immovable, being moved. I look past Jenna to the wash, like the desert flooding. I... I exhale, looking back down to her, I could feel my mind going blank, like it did earlier. Her expression's indiscernible, but she's still looking at me. I don't know how to answer, we kept each other sane, this town breaks people, hmm. So Jenna's chosen to reveal this to us, as it's just the two of us here, on one of our nostalgic walks sort of. So I guess she's revealing herself to Chase, her emotional vulnerability, so yeah, we kept each other sane. I was really fortunate growing up. I had a boyfriend I loved, a group of friends who supported me, and a family who gave a shit. And I'm not like the world's most mentally healthy person, you know? I see a completely alternate timeline where I'm just like the rest of the guys in Tetanus Addy, or worse. I rub the back of my neck sheepishly. 
I'm not good at making these reassuring speeches, but this is all stuff I've admittedly thought about before. That rat guy was right. Having someone around who gives a damn means the world. And isolating yourself from said world isn't how you make yourself better. It's the opposite. And for keeping me sane, I do think I kind of have you to thank for that in some part. My voice cracks, and I try to cover it with a cough. Smooth. Thanks, Chase. Jenna smiles lightly. That's actually rather beautiful. Has this been on your mind for a while? I shrug. Mm, lately, at least. Well, I'd like to think that his and your sentiments are true. If we have time, I might stop by to see Jeremy. When I talked to him, he sounded like he wouldn't mind seeing you again. Jenna chuckles briefly. It's strange, isn't it? The notion of you talking to him now as adults. As kids, we were all so at odds over truly stupid things. I suppose I'm curious whether he's grown up as well. I guess we'll see. Jenna raises a brow. N maybe, I mean. All this being said, I'm truly not excited to go back and talk to him or his friends. For Jenna's sake, I can grin and bear it though. I guess I have to ask, what made you think of this? I mean, the story about your grandmother. Was it just talking about tech stuff in the reservation? Jenna ponders this question for a moment, looking a bit more like her usual self. However, there's still a slight unnerved tinge to her, like her towel has an extra bit of bristle to it. I suppose that's what got me talking about her. Though, I started thinking about this all earlier. Oh. Up ahead, the screen door and the side of Duke's house flings open. A familiar ash-coloured figure peers out, attention focused on us. What are you two doing? Okay. He calls out to us, having to shout since we're nearly three properties down. At Pueblo, I'd cringe at the idea of someone shouting out this late in the neighbourhood. However, most of these houses are long since abandoned. Jenna and I exchange a look before making our way closer to respond. Okay, so we're going to talk to Duke in the next episode. We had some stuff, we had a bit of a chat with Jenna. And hopefully we've got a bit of a stronger understanding on where Chase's relationship with her is at. But yeah, we're going to find out more in the next episode. This is Usho signing off, and hopefully I will see you next time.